Good morning. Today is Friday, August the 19th, 2016. And I'm getting ready to go on a, on a trip to England with my husband. He's going to teach at Harlixton uh, College in near Grantham, England. And we're going to be leaving in a few days and we'll be there for the fall semester. So I've been searching through things that I want to bring on my trip. And I found this jewel from the past. It's a video called The Judgment Seat of Christ by Leonard Ravenhill. And I recently, just yesterday, went through this again, and it just was amazing how much that it blessed me. And so I want to bless you with this. Uh, with These are my notes from this video. And uh, here's a quote by Leonard Ravenhill. While we often huddle in groups of like-minded people, those with faith blaze a trail that threatens all of our comfort zones. Faith offends the stationary. That is so good, isn't it? And so um, here are some here are my notes. This video has shaken me to my very core. I will listen to this again and again. And I put up there a link to it. And it's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.youtube.com forward slash watch question mark V equals B dash one I capital I one X two X three capital C small R small O <laughs> if you can get that you're you're doing pretty good. So blessed is he who reads and hears the book of Revelation. That's the only did you know that's the only book of the Bible that has that John has attached a blessing to it? John, the writer of the Bible, he was one of the apostles. He wrote, wrote the book of Revelation, and he put in there a blessing. And I think it's in the very beginning. We all have a date with destiny. Jonathan Edwards said, Oh God, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. He prayed this before he preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. There is a labor that I must do. Everyone will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Revelations 6, 12 through 17 in the Amplified Version. When he, the Lamb, broke open the sixth seal, I looked, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun grew black as sackcloth of hair. A, a full disk of the moon came became like blood, and the stars of the sky dropped to the earth like a fig tree, shedding its unripe fruit out of season when shaken by a strong wind. And the sky rolled up like a scroll and vanished, and every mountain and island was dislodged from its place. Then the kings of the earth and their noblemen and their magnates and their military chiefs and the wealthy and the strong and everyone, whether slave or free, hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us before us and hide us 
from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the deep-seated indignation and wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath, vengeance, retribution, indignation has come, and who is able to stand before it? Fanny Crosby said, The first face I will ever see is his face. I will give an account of my life at the judgment seat of Christ. I ask you for a new revelation of you, dearest Heavenly Father. What is my picture of Jesus? Leonard Ravenhill refused to have any pictures of Jesus in his home. John the Apostle, who laid his head upon Jesus' breast, gave this description of Jesus. This is how John saw Jesus in Revelation nineteen, eleven through 16 in the Amplified Version. Excuse me one minute. After that, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse appeared. The one who was rise, riding it is called faithful, trustworthy, loyal, incorruptible, steady, and true. And he passes judgment and wages war in righteousness, holiness, justice, and uprightness. His eyes blaze like a flame of fire, and on his head are many kingly crowns, diadems, and he has a title inscribed which he alone knows and he alone can understand. He is dressed in a robe dyed by dipping in blood and the title by which he is called is the Word of God. And the troops of heaven clothed in fine linen, linen, dazzling and clean, followed him on white horses. From his mouth goes forth a sharp sword with which he can smite, afflict, and strike the nations. And he will shepherd and control them with a staff, a scepter, a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath and indignation of God, the All-Ruler, the Almighty, the Omnipotent. And on his garment, on his robe, and on his thigh, he has the name, the title inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Lord, teach me to be in the Spirit 24-7. Books will be opened on that day. There are at least seven judgments. There will be a judgment of the nations. What is my motive behind what I do? What could I have done, but I did not? Memory for those who will burn in hell will last forever. Hell is eternal. Revelation six, sixteen and 17 in the Amplified Version. And they called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us! Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the deep-seated indignation and wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath, vengeance, retribution, indignation has come, and who is able to stand before it? Revelations 9, 6 in the Amplified Version. And in those days... People will seek death and will not find it, 
and they will yearn to die, but death evades and flees from them. Psalm 2, 1 through 4 in the Amplified Version says, Why do the nations assemble with commotion, uproar, and confusion of voices? And why do the people imagine, meditate upon, and devise an empty scheme? The kings of the earth take their places. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. They say, let us break their bands of restraint asunder and cast their cords of control from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord has them in derision and in supreme contempt. He mocks them. If I repent now, you will forgive me because Jesus is now on the throne of mercy. At the day of judgment, mercy is over. Webster says, The greatest thought I ever had was my accountability before Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 11-15 in the Amplified Version says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ the Messiah, the Anointed One. But if anyone builds upon the foundation, whether it be gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each one will become plainly, openly known, shown for what it is. For the day of Christ will disclose and declare it because it will be revealed with fire and the fire will test and critically appraise the character and worth of the work each person has done. If the work which any person has built on his foundation, any product of his efforts, whatever, survives this test, he will get his reward. But if any person's work is burned up under the test, he will suffer the loss of it all. Losing his reward though he himself will be saved, but only as one who has passed through fire. For those of us who are born again, we will also face the judgment seat of Christ. Is my work wood, hay, or stubble that will be consumed by fire? Or is my work silver and gold and precious stones? Excuse me. Will I receive the prayer warrior's crown or the martyr's crown? Wood, hay, and stubble are above the ground. Precious stones are beneath the ground. Father God, what did you put in my life today in your book? Every penny I've earned since the day I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I'll give an account of it on the day of God, to God. You don't just take my sins. You take my life. You take the governments of my life. God is a sign of de- gold is a sign of devotion to God. You will read the account of my life before all the saints of all the ages. When you put the fire to my devotional life, am I just a showman? What is my secret life like? Like the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, The fragrance of my life that I pour out on Jesus will come back 
to me. Do I take the time to be holy? Look at all the riches there are through Jesus Christ. Will I come to judge the judgment seat of Christ rich in him or a pauper? Amy Carmichael said, From all that dims your Calvary, O Lamb of God, deliver me. Heavenly Father, bring me so near to your heart that I will grieve with you over the lost world and the backslidden church. Please, Jesus, Share your sorrow with me. Let me be mature in you and disregard all who sneer at me. Those who are the most heroic for you are those who have the greatest devotional life. Mrs. Reese Howells said of her husband to Leonard Ravenhill, You see that room? Daddy, she called him that went into that room at 6 a.m. to pray and stayed until 6 p.m. every day until one day his mother died. He did that for six months. Here is a poem. Here is the full poem of One Life, Only One Life, by C.T. Studd, S.T.U.D.D. Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart, and from my mind would not depart. Only one life twill soon be past, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one life. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then that day my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads, for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life twill soon be past, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and tears, each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one what life twill soon be past, only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek, to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life twill soon be past, only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep in joy or sorrow, thy word to keep, faithful and true whate'er the strife, pleasing you in my daily life. Only one life, twill soon be past. Only what's done, for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn, and from the world, now let me turn. Living for you and you alone, bringing you pleasure on your throne. Only one life twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, your will be done. 
And when at last I've heard the call, I know I'll say it twas worth it all. Only one life twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. The gold is representative of our devotional life. But what is the silver? That is every word we speak. Proverbs 10.20 says the tongue of the just is as choice silver. The fire shall try every believer's words. What a, what are the... Now, I want to say something about words. You can pray for crop failure. You can repent every day for any idle words. You can pray. The Holy Spirit will teach you to say words that are pleasing to the Father and then not say words that are not pleasing. You know, Jesus only said what his Father told him to say. Never more, never less. So let it be for us also. Now what are the precious stones? Think about the breastplate upon the priests in the Old Testament. It was divided into twelve and each stone had the name of a tribe on it. And the priest went into the holy place with that breastplate upon him. The world is sick outside because we don't know how to pray. That is truth. No man is greater than his prayer life. It is said of James that he prayed so much he had camel knees. Here is Leonard Ravenhill's account of Edward Payson, P-A-Y-S-O-N, at this site, www.ravenhill.org forward slash judgment dot htm. Edward Payson, better known as Praying Payson of Portland, was another great prayer prayer warrior. He used to kneel at the side of his bed and pray and pray and pray. When they washed his body for burial, they found great big pads on his knees like a camel has. Tradition says that James had camel's knees, but it's a living fact that Payson had them. When they were washing him, someone said, what abnormal knees. They're heavy with calluses. That's because he used to pray at the side of his bed with energy, and he wore two grooves about six or seven inches long into that hard floor when he used to pray and make intercession. Excuse me. The greatest ministry, I'm sure, is the ministry of intercession. I find the name David Brainerd, B-R-A-I-N-E-R-D. He was a young American who died at the age of 28. All he possessed was a cowhide that he wore with a rope tied around it. He used to ride over Susquehanna River to follow the Indians. David had a severe case of tuberculosis and only weighed about 95 pounds. I remember reading his diary once. He said, I got up this morning and the Indians were committing adultery and drinking, and beating their tom-toms, and shouting like hell itself. I prayed for a half hour after sunrise to a half hour before sunset. There was nowhere to pray in the Indian camp. I went into the woods and knelt in the snow. It was up to my chin. No, he didn't have a heater with him 
or anything else. He was just there in the frigid snow, tuberculosis and all. He continued, I wrestled in prayer until a half hour before sunset, and I could only touch the snow with the tips of my fingers. The heat of my body had melted the snow. What amazing intercessory prayer. I wept, I wept when I read this poem. I wept, wept when I read this poem. Here is Leonard Ravenhill quoted in the video mentioned above called His Plan for Me. When I stand at the judgment seat of Christ and he shows his plan for me, the plan of my life as it might have been, had he had his way and I see how I fought him here and I checked him there and I would not yield my will. Will there be grief in my Savior's eyes, grief though his love, he loves me still? Would he have me rich and I stand there poor, stripped of all but his grace? While memory runs like a hunted thing down the paths I cannot retrace. Lord of the years that are left of me, I give them to your hand. Take them and break them and mold me to the pattern that you have planned. The judgment seat of Christ will be an awesome day. When Leonard Ravenhill was at school, he was envious of two boys. Just one second, let me. Oh, I repent of those things, Lord. And let me be this day for wounded. Yours and yours alone. Hallelujah. Papa Hagen used to say, I don't know about you, but I preached me happy. Well, one thing I've learned is if you repent, then you forgive yourself. Your Heavenly Father will never forget what Jesus did for us. But he forgives and forgets our sins. And then you walk away as if you've never done it ever, ever. Because he forgot it. And you honor the blood of Christ when you repent and forgive yourself. And when anyone else repents or anyone else needs forgiveness, you give grace and mercy. <clears throat> Okay, when Leonard Ravenhill was at school, he was envious of two boys. They were always number one and number two on exam day. And when exam day came, they were so happy and excited. But he always had a stomach ache and would cry and ask his mom if he could stay home. She was wise and said to him, you can stay home tomorrow but not today. But those two boys loved exam day because they were prepared for it. We can be prepared for that great judgment day. We can be prepared. I still believe in the majesty of the eternal court that the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the judge of judges will rule over. I still think there will be an awesomeness about that day, so majestic. Paul says that there are at least five crowns to be given in reward, a crown of righteousness given to all those that love his appearing. 
A crown for the martyrs and a crown for the soul winners are three of those crowns. We won't be the same in heaven. There will be great distinctions in heaven. John Wesley said, I have an appointment every morning at 4 a.m. with God. John Wesley disciplined his life. He disciplined his eating. He disciplined his pocket and spending. He lived a disciplined life. If we can't live as a new breed of people on this earth, we've no right to live here. Excuse me. We ought to live every day with the power of heaven upon us to live and speak and move and have our being in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is going to be an awesome day. Have you kind of figured out how you'll get on when you stand there? To be judged for the deeds done in the body? for every aspect of our lives, for our praying, for our giving, for our living, for our talking? No, it's not so simple living as a Christian. It's a majestic thing. I remember crossing a square in Bath in the 40s, and I saw two ladies walking. There was something different about those ladies. When I came around and saw them from the front, I saw that it was the Queen of England and her sister Margaret. Then I knew there should be something different about us as ambassadors of Christ. There should be a dignity about us that is very different from the world. And the word of God says, As he was, so are we in the world. If we're love-controlled, love-motivated, and love-energized, we'll be all right. There was a lady in Ireland who had two shops. With the earnings of one, she paid the family bills. And with the earnings of the other, she paid for the missionaries, and she sent four of her own children to the mission fields. When we stand up there at the judgment seat of Christ, because there is one thing about being love-motivated, it's obedient. I say, oh God, I want this life of mine, adjusting so when I stand in your presence, 